Let's get into our Flux retrospective. We kicked off all of our hot takes with a word of the week. What if we do a word of the series? Uh, well, I've got one prepared. You do? Hit me with it. Rhyme. Rhyme. Okay. My word of the series would be takeaway. Oh, yummy. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a bit hungry myself. Uh, look, Dave, now that we've given our, our word of the, the series, I keep wanting to say word of the week, let's talk top level thoughts. Should we toss a coin on who does this or do you have a burning desire to go first? How should we do this? Why don't you give us your top line thoughts, Rob? All right. I went into flux with a sense that this was our third chance to get things right. You know, and surely we were going to have some luck with Jody's third series, even in the cut down series. I had a very open mind, as listeners will remember, and cards on the table, because that's my style. I reckon half of what we got is just fine. I really do. In each episode, there was something good happening, and I thought that was good, but, <laughs> and you knew there was a but coming. I think the six part structure which Chibnall was really crowing about before the series started, and which Moffat, incidentally, thought it was a really good thing for Chibnall to be doing. He talks about it in that Oxford talk I mentioned earlier in the news. I think the six-part structure mucks everything up, because by tying everything together, you get good episodes like Village of the Angels, but they're tied to this other weird, convoluted, overstuffed, nonsensical material. So rather than starting with a cocktail and then moving to an entree and then a main, Chibnall just sort of threw us this all-you-can-eat smorgasbord to begin with in the first episode. And I think that was meant to thrill people, but it just left me thinking, hey, there's already too many dishes on the table already and there's five more five more courses to go. What are we going to do uh, to keep up that strained restaurant analogy? Instead of building to a crescendo, it was just like, here's stuff. Here's more stuff. Here is even more stuff. Okay, kids, that's the end of episode one. How was that? I just think the structure was all wrong, Dave. My top line thoughts. Yes. Not totally dissimilar to you. There are a number of ways in which we can approach our reflections on flux. My first reflection is that as a piece of television that I tuned in once a week and I watched, overwhelmingly, I enjoyed this series. I was entertained. I thought it looked spectacular. There weren't a lot of things that annoyed me, uh, with the exception of episode five. <laughs> and I genuinely was engaged, for the most part, by what Chibnall was doing. I genuinely wanted to know where things were going and how things were tied up. So as a piece of television, as a piece of escapism, I thought it worked. And in fact, I thought it was probably the most consistently entertaining and engaging of the Chibnall Whitaker series. The others all had very dull parts and very high parts. This had a very consistent, just engaging level to it. As I say, with a drop down at episode five, I generally wanted to keep watching. On the other hand, though, and as you say, there's always a but. On the, on the other hand, as Flux recedes in the rearview mirror, I do see all the loose ends and I do see all the problems with it. And as I turn my mind over them again and again, and as I watch it again, I'm not finding that it all comes together. Certainly there are things that I missed when I watched it and that mm. I'm learning about or that I listen to other podcasts. And I go, oh, I didn't realise that happened. That's okay. It all comes together. But it didn't quite hold together as a six-parter, so I agree with you on that. Entertaining, but very flawed as a series. Yeah, and I had an example of, of that just earlier today on Twitter because I'd been talking about how Jodie was red hot to find out about her past, and then when she actually got there and had the pocket watch in her hand, she was like, mm, well, I'm not so sure, and then dropped it down into the middle of the TARDIS. And we had... I don't know if they're a listener, but we had someone on Twitter called Another Gay Boy, who's at Another RGB, and he has the theory that she was red hot to be getting the information about herself when it was in all these disparate places and she didn't know who to talk to and she was just pinging around trying to find it. But when she actually had it in the watch and thought, here it is all in one place, it became a different sort of thing. And I'm, I'm saying all this because that's an example of something that I didn't think of at all during the, the series. That's not how I sort of viewed it at all. But I thought another gay boy is probably quite right 
in saying that, it, it, it does maybe take on a different form, that information, when she has it in the pocket watch. Now, we don't have to go down a rabbit hole on the pocket watch now, but just as an example, Dave, of, of what you're saying, of, of how when you listen to other podcasts or talk to other people, you can be surprised by these other theories you didn't think of at all. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to sort of branch off there into the first big point that I wanted to make. Mm-hmm. And, and that is something that I think surprised me and and probably not in a good way we know that at the end of series two or the the second Chibnall Whitaker series the timeless child dropped it was this big fandom shaking series refining event where we learn that the doctor is not something that started with William Hartnell and it's just another time lord that went on an adventure but is the first of the time lords has been around for millions of years and is a big thing and the, everything we knew was wrong mm. I kind of expected that when that was dropped that was going to define the back end of the Whitaker Chibnall era it hasn't it mm. basically got brushed away for both the New Year's Day specials okay fine they they didn't want to do that in that setting okay I walked into Flux, though, thinking, okay, this is where we're going to start to do a deeper dive into The Timeless Child. And we really didn't. And I think that I did spend too much of Flux going, how does this fit in with The Timeless Child? And then going, oh, it doesn't. Mm. And and in fact, a lot of The Timeless Child stuff was brushed away. And to give an example now, I'm just going to sidetrack for a moment and say, over the last 24 hours, I've conducted four polls on Twitter, and I'm going to drop the results just in the appropriate parts of the conversation. Oh, very good. Uh, one of the polls I conducted was, is Tech Tayoon dead now? Mm. Votes, probably 68%, probably not 32%. So a majority of people who responded, I assume mostly listeners, are of the feeling that Tech Tayoon is now dead, gone, not coming back, mm. which to me... Is, is quite an extraordinary thing. We've built up Tech Tayoon as the guardian of the Doctor, the founder of Time Lord Society, etc., etc. We meet her, she's a funny old lady with a big hat, and then she's just sort of unceremoniously killed, and that's that. Mm. That, to me, is a very strange path to have gone down, given how big the Timeless Child dropped a couple of years ago. Yeah, look, I completely agree with you. Um it makes me think of how when Chibnall came to the role, it was widely reported that there was a five-year plan going on. And the fact that we're in just the third year, not not chronologically, but in terms of series, we're in the third year, and it was a very, very cut-down series, and now it's just a few specials and she's off. I'm wondering if there really was a five-year plan. I mean, sometimes it's true that there's a five-year plan. JMS had a five-year plan for Babylon 5. That was absolutely true. Others... You know, maybe the George Lucases of this world are a bit uh, more free and easy when it comes to saying, oh, yeah, I had all this planned out. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So I think that possibly, possibly, the, the series being cut down and maybe not churning out as many series as maybe he thought he'd even work on, I don't know, just means Chibnall's ideas for these characters and what they could do just have been curtailed and when he got to her part in this story he's like well she's, she's just got to be bumped off here no matter how weird and sort of nonsensical it makes that she could exist for thousands hundreds of thousands of years millions of years maybe and now she's just dead with one touch you know it's, it's just weird yeah and to, to make the second point i was going to make and the, the other really key point chibnall did drop into this series a big thing flux turned out to be one of the, if not the biggest things in the history of the show. It is literally a most of the universe destroying event. Yes. Now, it does link into The Timeless Child, but I'm not quite sure how. So let me just drop one more poll result and then hand back to you, Rob. Okay. I asked the question, in the end, did Flux make sense? Partly, but loose ends, 56%. Nope, not at all, 26%. Pretty much, yes, 19%. So a fifth of respondents there are happy that in the end it all made sense. The majority go, look, there are a lot of loose ends, but it partly makes sense. And a quarter of people just thought, no, this did not make sense. I am still looking back at the flux and still struggling to tie together a number of points. Uh, We'll draw a few of them out as the episode goes on, but I still don't quite understand why Division needed to destroy the universe 
because it needed to cleanse it of the Doctor. I, I'm still not quite sure what went on there. But to be fair to Chibnall, there are still Moffat series that, look, I know the Moffat defenders say that it's all there if you look hard enough and you blink hard enough and you, you squint and stand on your head and you listen and you imagine Moffat stuff all makes sense. Sorry, there are still Moffat season finales that I go, nah, I have no idea what was going on there. Uh, so Chibnall is not alone in this, but I don't think it all quite made sense. I think he tried to do too many big things in too much of a hurry. Oh, absolutely. Even though, you know, writing this kind of drama is allegedly, you know, Chibnall's bread and butter, he still managed to sort of stuff this up. Because I also think of people coming on in, say, episode two or three, not just fans who are watching for episode one, but imagine a a casual coming on in episode two or three or maybe dipping their toe in episode five, you know, to see how Doctor Who's going this year. It would have just been complete gobbledygook. I mean, seriously, if fans are saying they don't get it, and you've just given examples there in in your poll of that, and the BBC even put out a video where Chibnall explains the plot. Have you seen that? No. There is. There is an official BBC video where Chibnall explains the plot of Flux. I think if you've got to do that, there is a problem. It's clear that this isn't the easiest thing in the world to follow, at least fully. I mean, yeah, you get the head wobblers out there who are like, well, well, I got it. (laughs) You know, <laughs> well, yeah, golf, golf clap for you. A lot of people didn't. And you, you see them in droves on social. They've replied to your poll, Dave. And doing a story across so many parts that's hard to dip into, I can't see any other way than to say it just didn't work, particularly in this broad sense. This is TV that everyone should be welcome to, not just spotty anoraks. So I I see a massive problem there. Yeah, I I agree with those people, listeners who responded to you. Yeah, but on the other hand, to come back to my first point, I can't say that I couldn't follow the beats of the plot fine. I knew that the Sontarans were bad people. They tried to invade the Earth a couple of times. They were beaten by the Doctor. I, I understood that the Flux came along. It was trying to destroy the universe. The Division was behind it somehow, not quite sure how, but the Doctor stopped it. Swarm and Azure swanned around, the enemies of the division, they went and destroyed the division or partly, uh, and then they were killed. And mm. like, like, I got those plot points and I was able to follow the story sufficient to, for the most part, enjoy it. So I'm not, I'm not saying that I was sitting there, again, with the exception of part five, I'm not saying that I was, <laughs> I was sitting there and this was overly detracting from my enjoyment in the moment. It wasn't. I want to make that clear. But yeah. again, as I say, as it recedes in the rearview mirror and I look back and try and put it all together, some bits fall into place. Too many bits don't. Well, yeah, I mean, it does leave questions, not even just little ones, like what happened to the little sociopath Peggy? Where'd she go? But but bigger ones, why was was time sort of (laughs) using Swarm and Azure? And and you asked this question too, when they got zapped, were they ascending to some other role or or were they being killed or what was happening there or why did time why did time take on the form of who they were talking to it's explained as an ego thing but why why is time an ego thing for people you know is it just because of covid and they just didn't want to have more actors on the set i don't know well well let's let's talk about that because we talk about dropping big concepts in and and, and a bit not not enough not enough room for them all to breathe suddenly i realized part way through probably two thirds of the way through flux that there was this whole time thing going on. Now, initially they talk about the planet time. And I was sort of thinking, is this a a Legopolis type planet? Is it sort of involved in things? There were the sort of Vestal Virgin type things that um, the companions were very briefly turned into without much consequence. Mm. And, and, the Swarm and Azure took control of it and then they didn't and they'd had control in the past but they'd been stopped by the Joe Martin Doctor. So we had the planet time and the personification of time Mm. and I'm not quite sure what that was all doing. It's a very Doctor Who New Adventures type of concept. That whole thing of the McCoy Doctor being Time's champion is coming from there. It's a very, in my mind, literary type of Mm. concept. Uh, I don't know that it worked particularly well on television, but it just was such a big concept that I didn't even realise was being dropped. And and again, I I wasn't quite sure what was going on at the end there. And I asked it in my poll. This is the third one I've done. What happened to Swarm and Azure? Time destroyed them, 85%. They now serve time, 15%. So Mm. was their whole plot line to get their kill Tactaeun and then just be killed themselves? Because... 
oh, you know, you're not getting a contract next year? I, I don't know. I <laughs> That's one of those things where, as you say, you can follow the, the plot basically across this, but there are parts like that where I... I really don't know. And look, Dave, we're Doctor Who fans. We, we we love this stuff. We read new adventures. We we love sci-fi. We're watching this very closely. We're podcasting about it. If we're not picking up, up everything, it's no bloody wonder people out there aren't. Yeah, there was a lot dropped. Now, my sort of headcanon, or, or I guess the t- takeaway that I had from it all, when you put so much out there, you are begging for the audience to miss some stuff. This is, I think, incredibly much designed to be watched again and again and again and fall into place. Yeah. Just, um, it's just come to me now, question without notice. What about all the other passengers and the people they've absorbed? Are they just floating around in space with tons of people inside them in some sort of weird semi Greco Roman temple? Uh, well, well, al- to them? Al- al- along with the ninety percent of the universe that's been destroyed, apparently. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. You know, the, the, the stakes in this were big. Um, seven billion Lupari were wiped out. Yeah. Seven billion, and that's before you get to the Googleplex of people in the universe who have apparently been killed today. It's almost too big to really understand. You know, when when Russell T Davies does something like the fires of Pompeii. He wipes out something as big as a city. Now, that's already kind of too big for our brains to really appreciate. So he gives us that family, the Peter Capaldi's family, and, mm. and makes them the personification of um, the, the destruction of Pompeii. So we can emote as an audience and sympathise and empathise with the family representing the city. What we didn't get in this was any sense of what the flux was doing. I know some people cringe at the line in Logopolis, but that moment when entropy is slowly wiping out the universe and Nyssa gets her, I can't even see Matilla Orionsis, the master killed my mother, then my stepfather, and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. That's a human moment to try and show you, no, worlds and families are being destroyed. That was lacking in the flux. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it ties into one of my other notes here on something that didn't work. And don't worry, listeners, I do have notes on things that worked. But yes, I was just <laughs> thinking the same thing too. We've got to get to some positives in a moment. It, it, it just seems timely to mention this. Something that didn't work here was the way how very little in flux seemed to matter. As I said on our hot take, trillions of people have been wiped out in the universe and there's no weeping from anyone. Mm. There's no plan from the doctor on how to fix things. Or even an acknowledgement that nothing can be done, hence why she's doing nothing. You know, to sort of explain why she's doing nothing. There's there's no line at the end of Flux along the lines of incredible damage has been done to the universe, it is now our task to fix it. Or, or even a War Games type moment of, this is too big even for me, I now need to go and dot dot dot. Yeah, it's just this weird sense of, hey kids, we destroyed most of the universe... And now for something completely different. Yeah, moving you know, on. Uh, Dave, you raised genocide. That's a whole topic in itself, but it applies here to this point too. The Doctor commits a triple genocide without a thought. Now, there are more episodes to come, as the devout will tell you on social, but I don't see this bogging down the New Year's special. And so after that, there's only two episodes. Are we really meant to wait until Easter next year, at the earliest, to get some closure on something that's meant to be a six-part self-contained story? Or is the universe just gone? I don't know. No, and that is a question that is open. I would have liked it to be alluded to that this was going to be a thing that the Doctor would come back to. I I think it has to be, and I think they've just been a little bit careless at how they've done that. Yeah, look, I I think it's very irresponsible to have it happen in a self-contained six-part story and not address it again. Because there are probably people out there shouting at their car, stereo, or, you know, TV, or wherever they're listening to us. You know, saying, oh, they had the line about, you know, things can be uncompressed, Rob. That That's the clue. That's going to become a thing. Yeah, but it should be a thing within the six parts. You know, waiting until April of the following year or whatever is just crazy to my mind. Yeah, look, I'm more generous than you. I'm happy to leave it and wait and come back to it. But I would have liked it to be acknowledged that it was a genuinely, deliberately open thread. Yeah, well, fair enough. Should I should I go into some things that worked, Dave? Yeah, no, please do. And this might kick you off into some as well. 
I think Jodie's portrayal of the Doctor is something that worked. I think she got it right on the whole. There are a few slips here and there into what I call the children's TV persona. But on the whole, I think she was good. I wish she'd come out of the blocks like this. But like many Doctors who seem to feel their way into the role... Even someone like Capaldi did it. I think he was at his best in the in his third series. Oh, absolutely. She she's doing her best work here at the end. I think the one notable exception in terms of doctors is Smith. I think Smith does his best work in his first series and then goes downhill. I but agree I think generally well. Yeah, I think generally Jodie's doing what we expect of doctors and I I was quite happy with her across most of Flux even if the storyline of Flux was a bit silly. Yeah, look, a positive and a question in response. I wholeheartedly agree that Jodie Whittaker gave her best performance as the Doctor across this series. I think that she was much more intense than she has been in the past, much more careful about how she played the role and where she used energy and where she used subtlety. I think there were some really good and powerful performances for her. Between us, we gave her several Player of the Weeks this season, which I think is more in this six episodes than she's had mm. in any of her sort of 10-part series in the past. So big, big props for Jodie in that sense. We have now, though, seen basically the majority of the Jodie Whittaker, the 30th Doctor's era. And I haven't fallen in love with the Doctor's character here. Now, she's not a Doctor I dislike. There are there are a couple of Doctors, probably three Doctors, that I think are ones that I don't particularly like. And she's not one of those, I'm, I'm going to say that. But she's not one that I've really come to love or come to be engaged with either. And mm. I've got a question for you, Rob, and this is something yeah. I was pondering. I then listened to our friends over at uh, the Diddly Dumb podcast, and Hayden made a very similar point that sort of made me go, oh, maybe this isn't just me. Is part of the 13th Doctor's personality that she is a prick and we just haven't realised it? What, like tenant style? Well, there have been a number of instances where she's very unfeeling, she's very dismissive of people's problems, where she doesn't care that much about massive loss of life, and I wonder whether there's actually meant to be a bit of a deliberate personality trait here. Uh, you know, when she was a bit dismissive about Graham's wondering if his cancer was coming back, was that a mistake, or was that actually a part of her character, and we just haven't quite realised that actually the 13th doctor is a bit of a prick if if it is it's not being as well done as as the tenant thing because i've spoken about that on a on a recent episode i can't think of exactly when but yeah you know the tenant was very much that uh sort of hiding you know he's sort of this mockney git on the outside but inside he's, he's quite dark and vengeful i mm. I'd have to give that some thought. That really is a question without notice. I think the stuff like with the Graham thing and the cancer, she was kind of like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of awkward. I'll come up with something in a moment. I think that was more playing to sort of the, the, the Twitter crowd and, you know, oh, you know, sci-fi fans out there who are awkward, it's fine. The Doctor's awkward too. I'm not sure if that was part of a grander sort of plan for this character. It fell flat regardless. Uh, yeah, I'd have to give that more thought, to be honest. Yeah, I, I raise it, and I'm interested in the listener's thought as well. And, and look, maybe prick is a deliberately strong word I'm using to elicit a response. Maybe she's just a little bit less emp em empathic or empathetic than we expect the Doctor to be. Maybe there are other things going on. I, I don't know. Um, to continue the positives, though, the companions, I thought, were pretty good this season. I think mm -hmm. the, the, the way that the Doctor would go off on her own adventures more often than not and let the companions have some space to actually get involved in the plot themselves was really good. I think that Yaz also had her best season. I think that Mandeep Gill absolutely showed that given a little bit more material, she was really able to lift. Um, I'm not saying that Yaz suddenly had a fully blown wonderful, amazing character. Uh, she didn't, and there was that lurch between sort of super Yaz and ordinary Yaz, but mm. Yaz at least felt like a person and she actually got to do stuff. And let's just remember how little she's had to do for the last two years and that even <laughs> this amount here is a really good step up and Mandy did, you know, earn the accolades this season, I think. Yeah, this can lead into two of my uh, points I've jotted down on something that worked and something that didn't work. 
Something that worked in Flux, Dave, I think, is the two companions dynamic. Yeah. Th- this was a no-brainer all along, so it doesn't need much discussion. All through that era where she had three companions, we kept saying, this would be so much better if it was only one or two. And finally, we got two. Having two companions so that when a, a guest star or stars are thrown into the mix, things don't get too out of hand is really great. You know, Yaz and Dan with Jericho tagging along. That works. Yaz and Dan meeting up with uh, the miniature psychopath uh, Peggy. That works. Not psychopath, sociopath, I should say. There's an aspect of the companions that didn't work, though. And I'll I'll mention that now while we're talking companions. And I think that was sidelining the companions. You might see it as them going off on adventures, but I saw it as them being sidelined. And I, I look, I do get that it's a Doctor Who thing to split the TARDIS team up and give, you know, the companions something to do. But over the six episodes with a lot happening, the companions to me felt more at arm's length from the story. Like the story didn't know quite what to do with them or really needed them or wanted them involved in the A plot to the degree that we had that stupid episode where they just go around the world for no actual payoff in the end. They message Carvin Istra and he goes, I can't time travel. And that was the end of that. <laughs> I, I, I think that says it all there. They were they were sort of pushed arm's length away from the A plot, Dave. And that didn't work for me. Yeah, look, two two branch outs that I'm going to take from that. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, the first is to say that I utterly, utterly understand what you're saying, but I, I, I disagree. It, it, it worked for me. I thought the companions had space and were better used than they've been in the Jim Nall era. Um, so, yep, get it, but but no no from me. The second is, there was clearly a payoff to that Carvinista point, and that wasn't the end of the story, because when the character from Eight Half Hot Mum says to them, <laughs> fetch your dog, we initially as the audience and, and John Bishop's character, uh, Dan, took that as bring the dog to them on Earth. And they tried that, and the dog said... No, that doesn't work. And then when Dan did actually in part six go and fetched the dog and saved him, Dan said, "Ah, oh, he said to fetch, fetch my dog, and I did. And it was an inversion of what you thought. Now, that was a payoff to part five, but you need to really sort of be watching in the mindset to pick up those loose threads because it's very fast. And, and is it worth going through episode five just to get to that? Look, I, <laughs> I have said several times this episode that episode five for me was the weak part of the series i i'm absolutely convinced that that is two plot lines that have been truncated because of covid um and look let, let's make our one episode once an episode reference to the fact that covid absolutely did have effects on how this was written and made mm. and truncated so look, look we acknowledge that that is a very fair thing to say i do think that that adventure the companions on would have been much more expanded and would have had a lot more depth had we had eight parts rather than six. But nevertheless, look, it was, again, a piece of fun, and I enjoyed it in the moment. Looking back with a cynical eye, was it kind of a waste of airtime? Yeah, maybe. You can make that argument. Did I kind of have fun watching them travel around the world like where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Yeah, I did. So, which is right? I don't know. Mm. Oh, look, in a similar vein... Did the Lupari have to be dogs or was it just there so they could have, you know, the line that, oh, they've come to save Earth because, you know, they're man's best friend. (laughs) Boom dish. I I sometimes, you know, seriously wonder, are the Lupari just dogs for that line? (laughs) Yeah, I look, I I don't know. And um, a lot of people found the Lupari really interesting and Carbonista really fun. So it it worked. But but just to draw it back, we Mm -hmm. still don't yet know, and I'm not sure we're ever going to know, why on earth Carvanista wanted to dump the Doctor and Yaz in acid at the start of the series, <laughs> other than to have a really exciting opening to the series? And then he becomes a good guy. I I don't know, and I suspect on repeated watchings, that opening, when you know where Carvanista is going, seems to be a really, really bizarre. On the other hand, given we dropped all that stuff about, he's got the little thingy in his head so he can't do too much exposition, just enough, that kind of implied that maybe there's a... Uh, something more to Carbonista to come. You know, did he work with the Joe Martin Doctor? Is he billions of years old? Is there something else going on? Is he a double agent? Maybe that's all still coming. We don't yet know, but it seems odd. Mm. Can I give a positive? Please. This is, in my view, 
absolutely the best looking series of Doctor Who ever. And that's coming off the back of a couple of really good looking ones. Chibnall, I think, in a cinemagraphic way, has done a really good job as a showrunner. And that really paid off here. I suspect that where they did have to truncate episodes, there was some payoff in even more budget for the special effects to be much, much more compressed. And that was good. And I also think this is the season of certainly of New Who that has sounded the best. The score for this, I thought, was spectacular. It was orchestral. It was big where it needed to be big. It wasn't in your face. Look at me. I'm doing an awesome piece of music. (laughs) You know, hello, Murray Gold. Sorry, I don't enjoy Murray Gold scores. If you do, I apologize, but I don't. I thought this was amazingly good visually and musically. Yeah, I, I jotted down a shout out for uh, Seagon uh, at Canola. You know, he's gotten past just making sounds and yeah. tones, and he's actually made some half memorable pieces of music here, uh, which we did comment on during the season, and we probably should have commented on more because it was there a lot. I'll move into something that didn't work because we've kind of danced around a few of these topics and I'm just going to pull them together because I think it is an elephant in the room that a lot of people talk about with Flux, and it would be weird if we did a retrospective and didn't mention this. Earlier I mentioned that Chibnall tries to throw everything into the script, but I think if you cut Vinda and the Grand Serpent, suddenly we'd have no need for Belle and her as-yet-unborn child. (laughs) We wouldn't have that wretched unit storyline, and suddenly the story would open up and be time using Swarm and Azure to get the Doctor. Tech Taeun's a bit of a complication, and that's all the structure we need to hang a Sontaran story off and a Weeping Angel story off. Heck, maybe we could have even had a proper Cyberman story, you know, and, and maybe the being stuck on Earth thing could have had a point rather than just contacting Carvanista and he can't help them. The, the show just wastes so much time, Flux this is, all six episodes, wastes so much time trying to juggle 47 different balls it's genuinely ridiculous. And here's an old piece of juggler's advice, Chris Chibnall. If you only juggle four or five balls, it still looks impressive, and you're giving yourself a better chance of succeeding overall. I'll give you that advice for free. I'm really conflicted on this, Rob. I really, really am. Because I agree with you. I think that if we had simply told the story of Flux with the appropriate sidesteps, it could have been really effective. And maybe one of those sidesteps would have been the Grand Serpent and Vinda. Mm-hmm. However, without introducing Bell, without introducing Bell, but just, okay. just 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 sort of you know the Grand Serpent and Vinda. That's that's an episode. The the effects of the flux on this space empire like that could have been an episode. The reason why I'm very hesitant though is that they were many of the best things about this. The Grand Serpent I thought was a really good character, a really well played villain, and I enjoyed when him when he was on screen. He interacted with the Doctor really well. I think we both highlighted his scene with Jodie was really effective and one of the highlights of the series. True. I thought the chap who played Vinda, after a bit of a wobbly start, turned out to be a really effective actor and actually lifted some pretty naff plot lines and some pretty naff dialogue and made it work. So I enjoyed him on screen. Belle, take or leave. Kate Stewart, probably drop. But whilst I see the logic in dropping all the things you've said... Some of them were the best stuff in it, so, oh, gee. But but what about where it ends up, you know? Like, yeah, well, Belle exactly. and Vinda finally get together, and she's like, I'm pregnant. And he's like, oh, that's great. And then, they, <laughs> then they're like, oh, and Carvinista can come with us. He'll be like the family dog. Oh, that's great. You know, and <laughs> what kind of ending is that? Who cares? Yeah, look, I can't escape your logic. I, I, I can't. <laughs> I can't. I just... And again, it's that conflict between the cold assessment of this as a piece of writing and my enjoyment as a viewer. As a viewer, I enjoyed the scenes with Vinda and the Grand Serpent. I wanted them on there. So I I can't escape your your cold, rational logic, Rob. (laughs) But, you know, sometimes there's a place for eating a well-prepared meal, I guess. Oh, well, indeed, as Dave O would say. Something I wanted to say, Mm -hmm. I feel very vindicated by this season because I think this has proved once again that Doctor Who is at its best and most enjoyable when it is a fun adventure in time and space. The episodes that almost everybody, I won't say absolutely everybody, but almost everybody I've heard from, spoke to, seen on social media, have highlighted that the Angel episode and the Santaran episode were the two standouts of the series. And what were they? 
the two most self-contained episodes where the Doctor turned up somewhere and had an adventure with a monster mm. in time and space. I've been saying this for now, six seasons of the Doctor Who show. Doctor Who is about a guy in a police box who arrives somewhere, has an adventure, and buggers off, and that's all it needs to be. <laughs> yeah, I can't disagree with you there. Uh, a quick minor point I do need to bring up. Yes. Uh, and this is the fourth and final poll I did. The poll was, does the Doctor's triple genocide concern you? Yes, the Doctor should be better, 37%. Nah, they're monsters, 63%. So, look, I'm in a minority wow. on this one. Uh, and, I, and I get it. You know, the Doctor does fight monsters, and there were reasons for her to do what she did. It still sits very wrong with me. Uh, I do think I compare it to Eccleston. I compare it to Tom Baker and some of their moral dilemma moments. Was it potentially acceptable because they are monsters and maybe that was the only way to save billions more to stop the flux? I get that. I don't think that the episode lent into that, and I don't think the Doctor showed anything like the basic level of emotional conflict I would have at least seen. Uh, I would have liked to have at least seen some level of a, I have the choice to sacrifice billions and save trillions. The billions are Daleks and Cybermen. The trillions are innocents. Wow, I can't believe I'm back here again. Mm. You know, a moment like that, I think, would have got me past this, but just... How are we going to stop the Sontarans' problem and wipe out two species? I know, we'll wipe out three. Let's go. Yeah, yeah it was just too too, too casual for me. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, look, the final point I want to make before we sort of talk a bit about backgroundy stuff and then go to the sports desk for the final time is just to reinforce that there was too much in this and Chibnall was trying too hard. Look, it did feel a bit like... At the start of the series, Chibnall walked up to the desk, dropped his pants, flopped his old fellow out on the table and said, what do you think of that? <laughs> and we were meant to be impressed and it was just too much. He needs to sort of have a couple of big ideas and let them breathe. I think I've said that as succinctly as I can. And I don't disagree with you. Dave, before we get on to the sports test, though, should we talk briefly on the ratings for the series? This is a topic that people get very uptight about when, when, when anyone talks about it, but I think we need to talk about it. Yeah, look, why don't you talk ratings, then I'll talk audience appreciation. Alrighty then. Across the series, we started off with... I'll talk live ratings first, and this is people who watched, you know, overnight... We started off in the uh, the four millions, four point four three million, but from there we dived down. Every other episode was in the three millions. Some of them high, some of them mid. And what we found when the consolidated figures came in, now there are two different kind of consolidated figures. I'm going with the consolidated plus seven, so people who are interested enough to actually watch within the first week on some sort of catch up service. We had the first two episodes up into the five millions and all the other episodes in the mid to high four millions. So on one hand, you can say, well, that's very good. And from week to week, Doctor Who may have been, you know, the, 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 the second highest this or the third highest that on TV. So you can see that it's not performing particularly badly. At the same time, just a few years ago, and TV has not changed that much in just a few years, 10 million people tuned in to see Jodie Whittaker's first episode. Now, I know there was a lot of just general interest there, like, it's going to be a female doctor. My God, what's going to happen? But out of those 10 million people to be sitting here with less than half that number today, it's clear a lot of them didn't hang around to actually watch Doctor Who. So... On one hand, I don't think this series rated badly. I'm not going to be one of those Fox News style YouTubers who say, oh, the ratings are in the toilet. It's all terrible. At the same time, though, Doctor Who has bled off, I would say, two to three million viewers it probably could have if things were perhaps different. I think it's got room for improvement and... I guess we'll see what happens under Russell T. Davis uh, for that. Yeah, look, when you compare the ratings to other shows in the time slots and other shows during the day, they are very healthy for modern television. I think the show has done fine. It it did more or less hold up 
it didn't sort of have massive spectacular drops. Um, even after episode five, which I just thought was completely terrible, there wasn't a big drop off. I would have liked to have seen an uptick in episode six, but maybe that's just expecting too much of a modern audience. I don't know. I, I'm not r- worried about the ratings. The audience appreciation figures, however. <laughs> okay. When we did our look back at the Davies and Moffat eras, I think we noticed that only three or four episodes across the first 10 series of Modern Who dropped below the 80 mark. And and that yeah. was quite extraordinary. All six episodes of Flux are below the 80 mark, uh, which mm. genuinely surprised me. Angels came highest with 79. Uh, that is the closest to sort of being at that 80 benchmark. I was genuinely surprised that that didn't smash through the 80 mark and have the same sort of AI that most Doctor Who st- stories have had in the past. The lowest was Once Upon Time at 75, which I kind of liked, but maybe I was invested in the jigsaw puzzle that was being put together more than a casual audience, and that just didn't mm. work for them. Sontarans did well at 77 comparatively. Survivors got 77 as well, so people liked that one. But whilst I'll defend the ratings as being, frankly, very strong, not getting a single episode above 80 in the AI is does suggest that it's still not a terrible score, but it's below what Doctor Who has come to expect. And maybe there were members of the casual audience that were just a little bit not not getting this one. Yeah. And again, these aren't crazed YouTubers who are determined to hate everything about the show. <laughs> these, these figures are coming from, you know, regular folk out there across a, a broad selection of the community. So it, it is a genuine issue. Yeah, look, it it is. I think there'll be more conversation on that amongst fandom as we go on. And frankly, I think that's a more interesting conversation than the ratings one. Yeah, look, and and I I don't disagree with you, though. I I just hope it can evolve somewhat from people saying it's all bad and people saying it's all good. And, (laughs) you know, not really getting beyond that. Very true. All right, Dave, for the final time this year, should we go to the sports desk? Let's go. And here we are at the sports desk where typically we talk play of the week, foul of the week and MVP of the week. But now, Dave, in this episode, we're going to be talking play of the season, foul of the season and MVP of the season. Do you want to kick us off with your play of the season? Rob, I try to come up with something clever and witty and insightful and unexpected, but I failed. (laughs) <laughs> I have to give my play of this series to the first 10 minutes of Village of the Angels. That is some of the best shot, creepiest, spookiest, effective use of a monstrous, just enjoyable minutes of Doctor Who. I was utterly gripped by that opening of that episode, and it more or less kept me gripped across the length of that episode. It has been well commented on by fandom i don't think that this is a particularly exciting or original point but i wasn't going to pick something different just to be contrary when i generally thought that was wonderful and the play of the series fabulous i think the play has to be making a tv series during some of the worst parts of the covid crisis yeah very fair i know some out there might roll their eyes at my comment But I think making the series during COVID, during such a tough time, was a real achievement. And yeah, I I, I couldn't actually get past that, Dave. I'm going to give that my play of the season. I think they did well, the whole whole cast and crew. Excellent. Uh, Swapping it around, what's your foul of the season? (laughs) Well, clearly someone giving Chibnall a box set of Marvel movies (laughs) during the break between the second and third series and him thinking, oh, I'll grab that and I'll grab that uh, and that 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 and and then throwing it all in there with a note to the special effects guys. Hey, blow stuff up. Go crazy eight bonkers, you know, with so many elements and so much happening. Just like a Marvel movie, how can I fail? They make billions of dollars, right? Well, Chris, you can fail quite easily, as it turns out, fail of the season. It's interesting you say that. I think I am much better disposed to the Marvel movies than you are. Um, (laughs) Although I have no background or interest in comics whatsoever, I I do enjoy movies and have enjoyed two-thirds to three-quarters of that saga. And look, I will say I think that uh, Infinity War and Endgame are some of the most amazing feats of cinema for what they achieved and what they built up to and all the rest of it. They're really good. I've said before that one of the bravest decisions that Marvel made in Endgame was that after the snap 
in Infinity War. They let that go for five years. So, look, spoilers for movies that came out a while ago and, you know, everyone on the planet saw. Um, <laughs> Not me. Oh, there you go. Well, lock your ears if you care, Rob. Um, oh, I know it happens. Yeah, look, look. I think everybody thought that after Thanos snapped and wiped out half the universe, it would sort of be undone kind of quickly in the next movie. Instead, I think it was very brave and effective to go, no, the universe lived this way for five years and there are deep consequences. Maybe we are going to come back and go, the fact that Chibnall has left the flux still done, has not undone it, has not uncompressed it, and that is yet to play out, actually turned out to be a really brave thing and will pay off. I hope it does. If it doesn't, though, Rob, your foul is incredibly justified. Maybe you've just uncovered what happens at Easter. Yeah, and and that's the thing. It could be that we come back and when we do a whole Jodie Whittaker Chibnall retrospective, there will be more payoffs. Not sure. Mm. So, Dave, what's your foul of the season? I have collectively called my foul Division. (laughs) Right. I would very happily excise all of the Division stuff from this. I think that it was the weakest aspect of the season. I did not think that Taktayun added anything remotely interesting or useful to the plot and was consequently disposed of, as I've said. I don't think that we got any real sense of the grandeur of this universe-shaping department we got. Look, as you said, it was a nice designed room with a very pretty tree, but... (laughs) and, And look, again, I know they're filming during COVID. I know Doctor Who does not have the Marvel budget. But when I look at Loki and their version of basically what was the Division... Even without a big budget, you get a sense that this is a big thing with lots of people and lots of rooms that's looking out over the universe and playing God. I did not get that sense from The Division. I thought that in a story that should have been about the flux, they were just muddying the waters. I would very happily excise the whole thing. It was a bad idea done badly and a real drag on the show. Yeah, Tech Tayun just sort of standing there saying, oh yeah, there's heaps of us. Yeah, he- heaps. Heaps. Yep. More than you can imagine. Yep. There's heaps. They're, they're, they're all busy today, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and by the way, I've, I almost came along with the fact that they had that stupid all Sontarans go to sleep for 10 minutes at the same time in episode two, but conveniently yeah. didn't in episode six. Uh, that that, that was a runner-up for, for, for my foul. <laughs> Finally, our MVP of the season. I guess it's your turn to go first, Dave. I thought about this very hard, and there were a number of nominees. And again, look, it's it's easy for us to pull this thing apart, and we have, um, because, you know, we're podcasters, we're Doctor Who fans, that's what we do. <laughs> but when I came to think of my player of the season, there were genuinely many nominees I could come up with and I thought about. I landed on Kevin McNally. Because I think of all the things that many fans, myself included, will take away from this season, it was just what a good actor he was, what a well-written character that was, what a different sort of character it was, what an enjoyable character it was. If the mark of a good character and a good actor playing them is that when they leave the stage, you're begging to see more of them, Kevin McNally as Eustatius Jericho absolutely met that criteria in spades. I don't know anyone who does not want to see more of that character. They left the stage with us wanting more, and yeah, a good legacy for this season. Fabulous. What about you, Rob? Dave, I'm going to give my MVP to Jodie Whittaker. I absolutely considered her, and I'm glad you have. Yeah, this is the first series, as I say, where I felt like we knew her Doctor... Something I mentioned in previous series of the show is is something that I I don't think we'd really got to yet. Although she's still given some pretty silly stuff to do at times, and although the story, you know, doesn't really hang together, that's not on her. When she's stepping centre stage and saying something as the Doctor, she was absolutely the Doctor. Now, whether people prefer her or Capaldi or prefer Tom Baker or whatever, that's another matter. Jodie finally nailed what I think is her Doctor, which is the only Doctor she needs to worry about, because that's the only Doctor she's playing. I think, yeah, Jodie Whittaker for MVP for me. I think that when you separate the actress from the character, and I've still got some issues with the character, but yes, the actress, Jodie Whittaker, absolutely gave her best, was strong, had some great scenes, and I think that is a very, very worthy award. Alrighty, before we get to our final thoughts, we did have a word of the series, Dave. Yes. Do you want to remind us of yours? My word of the series was rhyme. 
And I'm reflecting upon that old saying that history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. I was also reflecting of the infamous comments that George Lucas made about the Star Wars prequel that he hopes that they rhyme with the original series. (laughs) And I'm looking at Flux, and I'm looking at history, and I'm thinking of a season of Doctor Who after the show had been around for a long while. Maybe it was in a little bit of trouble. Maybe the lead actor was a little bit controversial. And to get themselves out of this predicament, they put together a one story for the entire season where a Mm. bunch of adventures would be interspersed with lots of ongoing plot. And years later, we all go, that was a really bizarre decision. I quite enjoyed the individual adventures, but the trial scenes really got on my nerves and I wish they hadn't been there. (laughs) One day, will we say, I kind of enjoy Flux. Some of those individual episodes are really good. I like the Sontarans. I love the Angels. But I was just annoyed that all the Flux stuff kept getting in the way. I wish it hadn't been there. Is history going to rhyme? I think it may well. I think you could be right there, Dave. My word of the series was takeaway. Yes. And that's because takeaway, when you go and buy a takeaway, whether you're buying, I don't know, a Chinese or a curry or a McDonald's or a Hungry Jack's, that's Burger King for our American friends. Uh, It's another story we'll get to another time. Uh, You know largely what you're getting. And sometimes, sometimes, Dave, it can actually be a bit disappointing. Something can go wrong and it just doesn't taste right or whatever. Sometimes it can actually taste really good and, and excel. Maybe you're just particularly hungry that day. I don't know. But generally, you know what you're getting. And going into flux... I had a feeling of what we were getting, having already had a couple of series of Chris Chibnall, and by and large, I wasn't disappointed. He did all the things I thought he would do, basically. (laughs) You know, there there were the loads of chunky exposition. He sort of did stuff up the landing. You know, there are some big ideas that he seems to think are genius, but probably really aren't. So everything was there that I expected, even though I had to watch it to actually find out what those things are. But generally, the vibe... Take away, Dave. Take away. No, absolutely. When I'm sitting down and eating a pizza, do I enjoy it? Absolutely. Do I look back and go, that was a really sophisticated meal that worked well? No, it was a pizza. And I think (laughs) we uh, looped back to the start very nicely there, Rob. Well played. Thank you very much. Final thoughts, Dave. Do you want to go first or will I? Look, I'll simply repeat what I've said. I have enjoyed watching this series. I've enjoyed Jodie Whittaker's performance. It looked spectacular. Most of it was fun. Most of it was impressive. It didn't quite hang together well. I would have preferred more individual adventures. I think there are too many loose ends. There are some problems. Maybe we're going to be reassessing this in a year's time. (laughs) It was fun, but not perfect. Alrighty. I'm pretty disappointed with Flux. Not because I think it had no redeeming features. At the start, I said, look, I think half of it's actually pretty good but because of how much better I think it could have been if someone had said to Chibnall, mate, toss out 33% of this and beef up what you've got left and you'll have a much better story. But of course, as in many genre shows with a showrunner, there's no one who will or can actually challenge the showrunner like that. Even less so when the showrunner's writing five and a half out of six episodes like Chibnall did here. It's such a shame because one of the first things you learn, Dave, from Sesame Street, at least I did, is that two heads are better than one. <laughs> that was that was Harry singing to the two-headed monster. Do you remember I, that I song? do remember, yes. You remember that? Yeah. Two heads are better than one. But it seems when you showrun something, some ego comes into play that the showrunner knows best, or at least there's a there's a there's maybe a feeling that, oh, I've got to be true to myself, or some bollocks, you know, and, and I shouldn't take advice, you know, and things are just stopped from being great. So, yeah, look... It wasn't the bed-pooping disaster that some will tell you it is, the Fox News types on YouTube who determined that six months before it aired. But it makes plenty of fundamental mistakes that could have been much better too. You know, I, I revised all my scores down probably about 0.5 or, or 1 across the series when I was reviewing it for this, um, for this take. And it was just disappointing in the end. Uh, you know, it was bad enough that Jody's last series was cut down and for it to be cut down to this... Hmm, yeah, disappointed. No, I understand the point you're making. I certainly agree with you about two heads being better than one. Most of my favourite television is an example of that. Harlan Ellison supporting JMS on Babylon 5. Chris Boucher working with Terry Nation on Blake 7. You know, Letson Dix, Hinchcliffe and Holmes. 
yes. JNT and 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 and, and Cartmore, like many of the, our favourite areas of television in Doctor Who, are actually about partnerships. And I, it's not an accident. It's not an accident. So I think you're quite right. All righty. Well, that was our Flux uh, retrospective. Do let us know what you thought.